welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast series. I'm Nina Lockwood, founder and director of Intuitive Interim and Executive Search. Throughout this series, I will be sharing engaging conversations with talented leaders from across the UK transport sector. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jane English, People Director at Merseyrail, where she's responsible for the HR and stations teams. Jane English. People Director of Mersey Rail, a very warm welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast. It is lovely to see you, especially with the sun streaming in from the window there. Sunny day in August. How are you? Oh, Nina, thank you. I'm really well and it is absolutely gorgeous day today. So, yes. Delighted to be with you. Thank you for asking. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's absolutely my pleasure. So you and I have known each other for a while now and we kind of have our regular updates. I'm always struck by how positive you are, despite some of the challenges that a people director <laughs> faces. Um, but what I'd love to do, Jane, rather than kind of leap in with the role that you do now, in the traditional intuitive insights format, I'd love us to go back right to the beginning in terms of your own career. Where did you start? Where have you been? What have you done? And how did you get into the transport industry in the first place? Why trains? Okay, so um, I'm going to take you back 30 years, Nina. So, well, nearly 30 years anyway, to 1993. So I'm just about to graduate from Hull University, um, uh, a degree in politics and sociology. Now, let's be honest, that doesn't get you very far. So, (laughs) you know, there's not an automatic career path from taking that kind of degree. Um, But I did the normal kind of milk rounds and I applied. It was primarily, I have to say, to a lot of organisations, primarily around personnel, Mm. Um, you know, just doing that kind of degree I think you do have an innate interest in people in society and what's going on around you um so I apply to this knows I really can't remember how many organizations now um and I got one interview and that was with British Rail um so uh, we were still in the the kind of um the the age of, of British Rail at that moment in time um, so I remember being interviewed um, at the time um, by a chap called Mike McKechnie, um, who was the HR director um, on the kind of London Northeast line at the time. Um, and then I got selected to go to the graduate selection day. Um, and of the one interview that I got on the milk round, um, I got a job with British Rail. Wow. Um, so I would love to say it was because of trains and interest in geography. It had absolutely nothing to do with it. <laughs> It it genuinely was the only interview that I got. So I started on what was then the personnel graduate training scheme. Um, I was based in York um, because you still had regions. So I went to the kind of London Northeast region, um, did my graduate placement there. um, And then I went into a kind of HQ role um, after about 12 months, which was a a, a kind of training L&D kind of role. Mm. Um, and I think for me I did that for about again about 12 12, 18 months and whilst it gave me a really good kind of understanding of that particular side of personnel as it was then um, actually I knew it wasn't where my heart was and I wanted to really go into what you would have called that kind of more nuts and bolts um, kind of operation HR role right Um, so I got the opportunity, um, it must have been about 1995, I think, 95, 96, um, to move to Scotland um, to take up, I, I laugh at this, it was an assistant personnel manager. Right. Um, so, um, I went up to Scotland. I've met um, Nat, so that worked out perfectly for us, um, which I loved. Um, it was a fantastic place to live and to work, and you know, still have lots of friends up there. Um, but I think it kind of led me into some of you know the real highs of my, my working career. So at that time, uh, we kind of uh, were going through privatisation, and coming out of privatisation was GNER, Great Northeastern Railway. Yeah. Um, and, you know, running that that route at that time between kind of Scotland and London was one was one of the premier routes, you know, within within the, the kind of portfolio. Um, and it was it was an amazing time. We were, you know, a really forward thinking, innovative, 
absolutely customer service driven organization um and and you know i'm i may be biased and i'm sure there's lots of people who are in the industry at the time will say oh i'm not so sure about that but i think we were the absolute pinnacle of customer service within the industry at, at that particular time um you know and kind of going into the whole kind of christopher garnet period you know it was a real inspirational um kind of period within my career um I think what kind of happened, though, um, and I think the difficulty that, you know, when you kind of, you know, know that you're the best was a slight, you know, level of arrogance that kind of got into us. Right. Um, and you then had lots of organisations, you know, I think of Great Western particularly, absolutely chasing on our heels and actually probably in a lot of respects taking over in terms of some of the, certainly the onboard delivery that they had as well. Mm. Um but it really kind of, that period really kind of framed some of the thing around customer service and how you have be kind of grounded in customer service regardless of what you do whether it's an internal customer or an external customer um, it was just a, a fantastic place to work so um, spent a number of years uh, working in Scotland then I got the opportunity to increase my portfolio um, so I went down and covered from kind of Newcastle up to Scotland um, and again you know working in Newcastle a whole different kind of you know local culture in, in Newcastle yeah. um, but actually, you know, there's a real theme, you know, the working kind of Glasgow, Newcastle and, and now in Liverpool where I work, you know, they're very, very similar in terms of very grounded, very working class, but actually insanely proud of where you are. And you really feel that and you really felt that from the people that you worked with. Yeah. Um, so I did a kind of area operational HR manager. Um, so that would, you know, whilst it would cover some of the, the more L&D kind of stuff that really came from the HQ at the time. So this was really your kind of your, your day to day oper operational business partnering HR um, and really supporting the business with my team in those particular parts of um, the business. So it kind of we, you know, we get to kind of, you know, 2000, 2001, um, you know, and, you know, still doing that role. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years go past and then I have my daughter in 2004 um, and, you know, I had a fabulous opportunity. I was asked by the um, HR director at the time, Mike Goody, to actually move from Scotland down to York um, and take over the operational HR for all of the organisation. Right. Um, so it was, a you know, a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. It worked out for me personally as well in terms of where Sean was working at the time. Um, so we moved from from Scotland down to where I live now in West Yorkshire um, and took on this kind of operational HR. Um, I, I think we were bonkers, really, because, you know, Sean's family was in Scotland. My family was in London. We had a newborn child and, you know, we're just moving. And yeah. you know, so it was, you know, interesting times. But, you know, again, having the opportunity to become really that head of HR for that organisation, you know, was something, you know, you would never want to kind of turn down. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, just having the ability to expand my own portfolio at that time, you know, was was a really, really great career, career move. Um, so again, you know, did that for a few years then you started to feel the, you know, the winds of change within the industry and certainly, you know, within the, the um, business that I was working for. So reorganisations happened um, and I was made redundant um, from that particular role. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, um, and, it, and, and it is all around, you know, sometimes, you know, that kind of network, finding out about roles, people contacting you. Um, so I was I knew I was going to be made redundant um, and um, was contacted um, by someone I used to work with in Scotland. I'm sure you'll know Malcolm Brown. Yes, um, absolutely. Malcolm, you know, contacted me to say, look, I know you're leaving. You know, I don't know if you know, but Northern Rail have some opportunities coming up in HR. Um, you know, have a word with Trish Riley, who's yeah. now gone on to be HR director at CFL, you know. Absolutely. And it, it is about establishing that network and those contacts. So I did that. Um, and then it was about 2007, I think it was, um, I joined Northern Rail um, as head of organisational development. Um, it was a completely new role to Northern Rail, um, and it was a completely new area for me because, of course, I was very much in the kind of operational HR. Yeah. Um, it was a bit rabbit in a headlight for kind of a few <laughs> months, but for everyone, if I'm honest, in terms of what what is this role, what do you do, what yeah. value can you bring? Um, but actually, there was a real focus within Northern at that time around performance management. 
um, and actually raising the standards and raising the bar. Um, mm. So that's what myself and um, I had a small team um, who actually really kind of focused on, you know, that kind of performance management side within Northern at that time. Um, and then, you know, again, one of these kind of fortuitous things, um, the head of employee relations uh, was asked to go to go off and do some some bidding work. Um, so got the opportunity and asked whether I wanted to kind of take on the head of employee relations for Northern. Yeah. And um, and it kind of, in a way, felt like coming home um, in that kind of operational yeah. kind of HR role. Um, so took on the head of ER, um, ended up doing that for around four years. Um, that was that was quite a harsh role, I have to yes. say. Um, yeah. You know, lots and lots of change at the time uh, within Northern. Um, spent ma- vast majority of my time working with trade unions, um, and it, you know. It, I, I think I'll say that four years was enough. Yes. You know, it, 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 you know, it was quite a hard yeah. role um, to kind of keep going. With. Um, but just at that, the end of that kind of time, um, our uh, shareholders were the same as Merseyrail. Um, mm. So both the shareholders of Burley and Serco, so effectively Merseyrail were a sister company. Yeah. Um, I was approached to see whether um, I would like to consider um, the HR director role at Merseyrail. And, um, you know, let's be honest, you'd be absolutely bonkers not to kind of think, you know. I always knew it was an aspiration. Um, my HR director in Northern at the time, Adrian Thompson, had specifically put a coach in there for me to help me, you know, to reach mm-hmm. that aspiration. So, you know, so he was a great, you know, kind of role model in terms of recognising someone of that talent and, and nurturing them to kind of go mm-hmm. on. Um, so... Um, took the opportunity, you know, went and had a chat to the to the MD. I won't say it was a robust recruitment process, um, but you know, <laughs> went to see went to see the MD, went to have a chat to the the HR team, um, and you know, got the opportunity to move over to Merseyrail. Um, and you know, going into it, um, it's a you know, it's a it's an amazing place um, to become a first time director. Um, and actually, a lot of the a lot of the um, directors within Merseyrail quite often it is a first time directorship, right? Um, because it's an amazing organisation um, that you can kind of get your arms around and real, yeah. will really nurture you. Mm. Um, because you don't just kind of get a badge that says director and then you suddenly know what you're doing. Mm. You know, you, you have to you have to kind of learn the craft of being a director. Yeah, um, and it's not just about being really good at your own functional specialism Mm -hmm. you know you need to learn your place at the table you need to learn you know the politics of you know of being a director and and working in that kind of environment um so you know going into Merseyrail was was just a fantastic environment to be able to do that and have the space and the time to actually be able to do that as well which Mm -hmm. which was amazing um so I've been at Merseyrail since 2011 um so primarily um kind of doing HR um until about three years ago when I kind of went from being HR director to people director um and the reason why um it's not just a change of title was that I actually took on the portfolio of stations as well uh for Mersey Rail um so it is a slightly I suppose unusual role um, yeah. within the rail industry. It's not unique. Other people, other talks have had this role, yeah. um, but I think there was there was a couple of reasons why we chose to do that. Um, first, it, you know, it was you know recognised to give me another skill and actually to give me another challenge within my yeah. role, which I'd, I'd been in for a, for a number of years. But also, you know, the, the frontline customer service. Um, actually, you know, when you look at the, you know. Of, of how we're going to drive that kind of customer service forward. How do you do that? It's through your people. It really yeah, is through your absolutely. people. Absolutely. And so actually having someone with that kind of people background and that kind of interest in people like that actually mm. was quite a natural move for us at the time as well. Yeah. Um, so have been doing that for do about three years now. Um, and then just to kind of tag on to that as well, um, deputy M- MD for Mersey Rail as well. So I kind of I have two hats, but my my kind of day hat is yeah. people director at Mersey Rail. Brilliant. That that just um, that trot through your career. I've really enjoyed that, Jane, because we've never we've never done that in that kind of level of detail in our conversations. Yeah. 
And what strikes me, there's some there's kind of some stuff that I'd really love to pick up on, if I may. So you kind of mentioned around um, GNER being the pinnacle of customer service. And back yep. at that point, I imagine, so I, you know, I'm just about coming up to my 10 year anniversary in rail. So I'm still the new girl in lots of ways. <laughs> um, but the I don't think at that point that customer service was where it was at. In, absolutely. In, in British Railways terms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have heard mention of Christopher Garnet over and over again in the same kind of legendary capacity as we hear about Chris Green. Yeah. You've obviously been inspired by Chris Garnet. What was it about his leadership style that really kind of brought that customer service to the fore? What was it he did? Um, so I think he was he was always there on the front line, you mm. know, and he always knew and understood about those front line roles. So, um, you know, he was very much in the detail, which is a good thing and a bad thing sometimes. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Um, you, you could absolutely rely on him for his honesty, for his openness. Um, he would absolutely get in there and get his sleeves rolled up when it was appropriate. Mm. Um but also he was a really personable person as well. Right. So, you know, he would remember crew members. He would remember their names. He would remember the journey that he had with them last mm. time. Um, and, you know, he he just inspired that actually what he was talking about, he really believed in. Yes. And, yeah. and that was that, that authenticity uh, was absolutely critical. Mm you know because when you know on what it means to the business you'd absolutely believe that that was right and it was correct he was an incredibly authentic leader and I think yeah. that was the you know the real the real critical thing um and just you know he, he he genuinely cared he genuinely cared about the business and also about its people as well and yeah. I think he saw them as absolutely integral to each other he didn't see them separate um and I think that's really why he inspired so many people who worked with him yeah, and, and obviously you're now bringing that into your role because of that that frontline interaction. And as you've said, yeah. without it's yeah. the people that deliver the service. So you, as an organisation and as a director of that organisation, it's your job to empower the people to deliver the service, isn't it? Because you can't be there Absolutely. on the front line doing everything yourself. So you need to be able to kind of empower and inspire that team. Um, and I, I love that description. Um, and I think that... the the, the term authentic leadership and maybe the word authentic, we're hearing more and more to the point where I'm kind of thinking, oh, is there a danger that we're overusing it? And it's becoming just one of those kind of words of the moment, like unprecedented yeah. was two years ago during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it is it, it does what it says on the tin. It's kind of being the real you. And if as a leader, Absolutely. you're able to be the real you, then you're giving everyone else permission to be as well, aren't you? Um, yeah, I mean, we talk about something about about bringing your best self to work. Mm. Um, and it's about, you know, not having to feel that you've got that mask or you feel you have to bring someone different to work. Yeah. Actually, we want you, we want you to bring your best self to work and your best self is your authentic self. Yes. You know, so that's something we talk about, you know, it is yeah. really important to us that everyone feels that they, you know, that they have the ability to be able to whoever they are to be able to bring that best self to work. Yeah, it's so important. So, so important. Um, you mentioned kind of almost in passing, but I wanted to pick up on it because I know for me, do you know, sometimes people say to you, so what what do you wish you'd know? What do you know now that you wish you'd known earlier in your career? And for me personally, it's the power of networking. It's the power of the people that are around you that you get to know throughout yeah. your career. Um, and you kind of you mentioned that in the context of of Trisha Riley. I think you were kind of yep. looking at yep. that network. Um, how important has that been, Jane? That that network as you've gone through your career, and how do you build it? How have you gone about building and nurturing it? Well, it's really interesting because it's only kind of you know as I've kind of gone on in my career, and, and really, in I suppose these latter years, that I've kind of ever looked back and thought. Oh, yeah, that was, oh, yeah, they introduced me to, and oh, that was because of. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I was not an active networker, mm -hmm. um, you know, to my, probably to my eternal shame. 
um, but it wasn't something you know that would either come naturally or I would actually think about but I have been so fortunate in my career to actually you know have some really influential people that have really helped or shaped yeah. you know what I've done um, but it has been more luck than judgment you know right. I'll be honest um, but actually if, if I was going to say something to anyone um, and quite often having that network and having that network of people that you can go or actually just a have you heard this mm. you know it, 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 what actually is happening is actually really really important yeah um so yeah so so it, it, one of the things that, that probably I would have thought about earlier in my career is actually how do I actually really develop this network? Not necessarily just to kind of get on in life, but actually to be able to support in that kind of that kind of environment. Um, yeah. Because actually, as, as you go up, you know, that kind of career ladder, it can start to get lonelier and lonelier as you yeah. kind of go up to different kind of levels. And so to have that network around you to say, actually, what would you do? Or how would you do that? Or have mm. you come across this before? Is actually really important. Yeah completely agree and i would i would definitely not say i've i've approached networking in any kind of strategic way i think you and i are probably quite similar in this we're just quite we, we're interested in people aren't we and yeah. we're like yeah. we, it's the relationship stuff so you turn up at an event because you're interested perhaps in the speaker or it's a key industry event and you happen to get talking to someone that you stood with or you sat next to and you realize that oh we've got something in common and so that conversation just naturally yeah. develops and the, the relationship will naturally develop um but I you, you know I know people say to me oh you know you your network's amazing you know everybody and it's kind of well yeah I think there's a because you're interested in people and that, that's yeah. just a massive thing for me but and I completely agree it's not just about kind of um there's lots of different reasons for having a network and that ability to be able to say to people have, have you come across this have you been through this what would you do is really, yeah. And as you say, the, the more senior your role is, then the, the lonelier it gets sometimes. To, so to have a sounding board and to have that support is quite um, it's quite critical, I think, in terms of your own development. Um, the third thing that I wanted to pick up on is that you mentioned that you had a coach. Um, yes. I've literally had a conversation um, of like literally about two hours ago with somebody about this this very same thing. And how important. So I've had a coach off and on since I worked for the Royal Bank. So, gosh, I don't even want to think about how many years ago that is. But I, sometimes for a specific reason and other times yeah. just because, you know, there's been a lot of pressure on or whatever. And I just felt like I needed a sounding board. So is that something that you've carried on with, Jane? Have you had have you used a coach at various points in your career or is kind of was it just around that particular point when you were working at Northern? So I think there's been two specific times, really. It's been when uh, when I was at Northern. Um, so that was for quite a kind of specific purpose in terms yeah. of career development. Um, I'm really focusing on me to say, actually, how do I move from being, you know, that senior management to be able to go off and, you know, to become a director? Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's quite a common uh, way of kind of using, you know, coaching. Um, but also when I was a new director, um, you know having a completely different type of coach yeah because actually you know you're in that position now and suddenly you're in that position and I, I think I said it earlier you know you, you have to learn that trade yeah. you know and, and who do you learn from you know yeah. you, you know sometimes you're not actually given a lot of time and you know something might happen and you know suddenly you're the focus and you have to think to yourself okay you know I'm first time in this I've not done this before and how am I going to cope and what are you know, to have someone to actually to be able to spend some really dedicated quality time yeah. thinking about you and talking about you is something, you know, that we don't often do. Mm. You know, we, I launched a leadership program in, in Merseyrail um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I said to them, you know, really use this time, really use this time. Because how often do you have a day when you do nothing than think about yourself oh, absolutely. and have time to think yeah. about your own development. Oh, yeah. And it's exactly that same kind of scenario is actually, you know, for an organisation to invest in you and to say, we're going to pay someone to come in and work with you, to spend quality time with you, to develop you. Yeah. You have to take that and you have to run with it and absolutely yeah. get the best out of it you can. 
Yeah, it's massive, isn't it? It's yeah. um, a really good friend of mine who is a, is a leadership coach. Helen refers to it as holding space. So somebody is holding that space for you on a regular basis. So whether that's every month. So for me at the moment, it's two hours every month when I literally, the lid goes down on the laptop. It's just a conversation where there's no emails flying in. There's no notifications for WhatsApp, blah, blah. It's just a conversation that goes where I want it to go. And obviously with the guidance of, of the coach to kind of focus on the challenges that I'm dealing with as a leader in my own business so yeah. I'd, I've, I'm a massive fan of coaching but I just when you mentioned it I thought gosh this doesn't get mentioned very often so I wanted to pick up on it yeah. because I've just as I said just had a conversation earlier on this afternoon um, with um, a client because we've introduced um, as part of the value that that we're bringing to our clients at Intuitive We've introduced a 90-day accelerator program for all of our um, executive and and senior permanent placements to give them that support for the first 90 days. To your point, becoming a director, becoming going into a more senior role, just because you've been very good at your previous role doesn't mean you that, that you arrive as the finished article, does it? Absolutely. There's so much yeah. to learn and having that support early doors, I think, is just really critical. Um, so, yeah, it's really it's taken us right off at a tangent there, but I didn't want to <laughs> let it go without yeah. kind of asking you for your thoughts on it. Because I think it's important that people know that leaders do have support and they do have yeah. they're, they're not the finished article. There's still stuff that you're learning, even though you've gone into a really senior role. Um, So now comes the part where I get my magic wand out, Jane. Um, So we have, you know, we've got our fair share of challenges in the industry at the moment as it stands. So we're recording this on the 8th of August. So we're kind of middle of of summer and um, all sorts going on in the industry. Um, So it's in in time-honoured Intuitive Insights fashion. I'm going to get the magic wand out and say, if we could change anything, Jane, if we could focus on anything, what would your three wishes be for the UK rail industry? Um, so I, I, you know, I, I can't not talk about the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, my first wish would have to be, you know, that the the IR situation the industry has at the moment is resolved. Um, I, I don't know what that word resolved looks no. like at the moment. Um, you know, but as an industry, you know, you know, having a reputation of, you know, striking over summers and, and all these kind of things, you know, I, I, I that would absolutely be my first kind of wish that we could resolve this, you know, to whatever kind of that resolution looks like. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing is I would really want the rail industry to be seen as an employer of choice for the talent in 22 and 23. Yes. And that, and and I am afraid of the reputation that IR brings around that reputation as an employer of choice. And why is it an industry that you would actually want to come and join? And I think that kind of reputation piece, you know, how how do we think about that reputation to actually really attract some of the top talent, you know, that we have in this in this uh, country? Yeah. And I think the other thing is around. And this is with an eye to the future is actually how do we work more collaboratively on enhancing the whole skill set within the industry and some of the challenges we've got around that. Um, I did a piece of work um, around kind of age profiling our our organisation. And when you look at some of the the operational roles and the kind of age profile, it's quite frightening, actually, um, in terms of you know, the driver profiles and and looking at that age profile. Mm. So how do we attract that younger talent? How do we nurture that younger talent to be coming into our industry? Mm. I think is probably a real, real challenge that we have. Yeah, I think it's yeah. massive. And um, I won't, I'm not going to apologise for repeating it because I know I've, I've said it somewhere else and it may be on, a, on another podcast that um, recording that I've done recently. But I took part in a webinar um, a few weeks ago, the Rail Skills Forum. And uh, Neil Franklin from the National Skills Academy for Rail was doing a presentation uh, first thing in the day. And one of the statistics, there was quite a lot of of information that Neil shared, which is really valuable to the industry in terms of where we are 
on the skills agenda and the fact mm. that we are facing a cliff edge in this. Yep. But to your point in terms of, of bringing people in and because we are losing them off that cliff edge because of the age profile, but the, the number of people in the rail industry who are aged 25 and younger has halved in the last five years. Yeah. So whereas it should be doubling to account for the fact that we are going to lose lots of people because they are approaching retirement age. Um, and if we if we lump that together with the fact that because of the pandemic, then behaviour is changing and people are taking retirement at earlier ages because they're choosing to go and do something different. They've had that period of reflection and, you know, I, I want to do something else with my life and et cetera. We've got all of this stuff happening but we're not attracting people in. We're not filling them in at the at the other end, you know, in terms of this kind of, we're going to put some in at the hopper because we're losing them all out the other end. So it really worries me as an industry, what we're doing about it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I kind of say to myself, you know, if, if you're, you know, a young graduate or someone who's just been through an apprenticeship or you're leaving school or, you know, you, you might be on that kind of second career, you know, what is it about our industry that would make them think, well, I'll just nip on and see what roles there are. What, what is it? What, it, what is that hook that we're going to have to have to be able to attract that, that, those people that we want to join our industry. Mm. And I'm not sure we know yet. I'm not sure we no. know. And I think we will have a reputation piece um, to make us that employer of choice. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's loads of information out there in terms of what um, the millennial generation is looking for from an employer. And it's quite different to what you and I were looking for when we started work. Um, And so I think there's loads of good information there, but then making that change happen. Um, even if we look at, you know, something like diversity and inclusion in terms of what the rail industry looks like as a whole, then what are we kind of that that pace of change needs to be better, doesn't it, across the board? So loads to do. I think your three wishes are absolutely spot on, and I agree with all of them. Um, that employer of choice thing, I think at the moment what we're finding at the senior end is that there will always be pioneers. There will always be people who want to come and save the day. So yeah. we are we are attracting people in from different industry sectors, we're recognising that people who've, who've been in the rail industry or actually transport, so also from bus, from aviation, have got transferable skills and want to be part of the change and transformation. Um, but pioneers are not going to make up all of the people that we need to replace Absolutely. the people Absolutely. that are going. So, yeah, yeah we've got um, I think we've got a sticky situation ahead of us there. But um, and as people director, then you'll be uh, you'll be right in the thick of it, Jane, won't you? Absolutely. Yeah, am. yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, gosh, there's so many things that I could talk to you for hours about this stuff, um, but we don't have hours. So I'm going to kind of bring us up to the, the final part of the podcast where I ask you to to share a quote with the audience, Jane, something that's kind of meaningful for you um, and uh, and give us, yeah, give us some context of, of why it's important. Okay, so um, the one thing, and um, my mum used to say it to me and I say it to my daughter now, but there's lots of different reasons why and it's don't, don't say things for best because sometimes best never comes. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we all have things in our wardrobe and you think, oh, I'm not going to wear that. I'll save that for best. You know, yes. and, and that's where it kind of comes from. But actually, I think what COVID has done um, more than anything, I think, over the last two years is sometimes you just have to lift your head up and you actually have to look around you and appreciate what you have here and now. Yeah. And I don't think sometimes we do that. Um, you know, in COVID, certainly for me, has made me kind of think to myself, my goodness me, you know, I'm very blessed, mm. you know, and, you know, this is my best kind of thing. Yes. And best I should actually, now. yeah, and, you know, and I should really appreciate everything that is around me. Mm. Um, lift your head up, you know, and actually look at that, look for the positive that you actually have today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so for me that you know and I can hear my mom saying it to me and I say it to my daughter all the time in terms of you know you know you need to realize what you've got here and now yeah um, and sometimes we just don't lift our heads up and appreciate that yeah no I think that's you, you do don't we've all got things that we save for a special occasion 
Um, but as you said, like the special occasion is now. It's today. It's being in the yeah. moment. And um, yeah. there's, I remember coming across something on social media ages and ages ago about somebody finding a scented candle that they'd bought and they didn't want to burn it because <laughs> it, you know, it would like then it wouldn't last. It would have gone. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. yeah, but that's the point of a scented candle is that you burn <laughs> Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Know? I'm the same. It's white shirts with me. I buy a white shirt and then I think, oh no, I can't wear it because I might get it dirty. Might spill something. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> What's the point I... of buying a new white shirt then? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I, love I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us because that's actually resonated with me really strongly as well. Um, so Jane English, People Director at Mersey Rail, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, and I know that our audience are going to enjoy it as well. So thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you, Nina. Been delightful to talk to you as always. My thanks to Jane for sharing her thoughts and her insights. Gosh, so much to do, especially around the people agenda. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and please do join us for the next episode of Intuitive Insights, which will be with you in a few weeks time.